Hello, welcome to another virtual program with Maine Historical Society. It is May 12th, 2021. I'm Kathleen Newman, and this is our co-curator panel on Maine Historical Society's newest exhibit, Begin Again, Reckoning with Intolerance in Maine. And tonight are the co-curators of that exhibit, Ann Gass, Tilly Lasky, Darren Ranko, and Crystal Williams to discuss the topics that are covered in the exhibition. Um, the exhibition and the panel um, are gonna discuss structures of systemic racism and discrimination that have perpetuated inequality and intolerance in Maine for the past 500 years, as well as talk about how they came together to explore and interpret Maine's diverse and complicated history. Uh, so before we begin, a little bit of background about our panelists. Anne Gass is the author of We Demand, The Suffrage Road Trip, a tribute to the grit and determination of the suffrage movement's unsung heroes. It's based on the true story of an epic cross-country trip that took place in 1915. Anne is also the author of a book about her great-grandmother, uh, Voting Down the Rose, Florence Brooks White House and Maine's Fight, for Women's Suffrage, published in 2014. She is a frequent speaker on her books and women's rights history at libraries, museums, senior colleges, high schools, and other venues. Tilly Lasky is a museum curator specializing in native art and culture and collaborative curation. Born and raised in Maine, she has curated at nationally recognized museums in Maine, Minnesota, and South Dakota. In 2014, Tilly joined the Maine Historical Society in Portland, where she currently works as the curator, managing on-site and Maine Memory Network online collections. She has curated and co-curated significant exhibitions at MHS, such as 400 Years of New Mainers in 2016, Holding Up the Sky, Wabanaki People, Culture, History, and Art in 2019, and State of Mind, Becoming Maine in 2020, and of course the forthcoming Begin Again, Reckoning with Intolerance in Maine. Tilly is a published author of articles and book chapters and is the co-author of the book Precious and Adored, The Love Letters of Rose Cleveland and Evangeline Mars Whipple, 1890 to 1918. Darren Ranko is a citizen of the Penobscot Nation and the Associate Professor of Anthropology and Chair of Native American Programs at the University of Maine. He has a Master of Studies in Environmental Law from Vermont Law School and a PhD in Social Anthropology from Harvard University. His research focuses on the ways in which indigenous communities in the United States resist environmental destruction by using indigenous science, diplomacies, and critiques of liberalism to protect natural and cultural resources. He teaches classes on indigenous intellectual property rights, research ethics, environmental justice, and tribal governance. As a citizen of the Penobscot Nation, he is particularly interested in how better research relationships can be made between universities, museums, Native and non-Native researchers and indigenous communities. Crystal Williams is the founder and manager of Providentia Group, a legal and business advisory firm. In 2011, she through hiked the Appalachian Trail, which later led to her relocation to Maine. In 2020, Crystal founded the Alpha Legal Foundation, a nonprofit organization focused on increasing diversity in Maine's legal profession. Profession. She is the board chairperson for Kinotech, a rapidly growing Maine startup, and sits on the boards of the Learner Foundation and the ACLU of Maine. Crystal holds a JD cum laude from the University of Maine School of Law, an MBA from the Amos Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth, and dual BAs in mathematics and psychology from Williams College. Uh, thank you all for joining us here tonight. I know the audience uh, thanks me uh, in welcoming and joining um, this really uh, learned and accomplished uh, panel of co-curators. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Tilly Lasky uh, from MHS um, to take us into this discussion. 
Hi, thank you, Kathleen. Um, I'm really humbled and honored to be in the company of my co-curators here. Uh, it's, as you heard in our introductions, it's really an amazing group to have worked with on Begin Again. Um, so I'm gonna do a, a three minute introduction and then we're going to just start have a, having a conversation between the four of us. So uh, here it goes. I'm joining you tonight from Brunswick, the past, present, and future homelands of the Wabanaki nations. This land and water has supported me and my family, much in the same way other white families in Maine have benefited from land taken from Wabanaki people. Our exhibition, Begin Again, Reckoning with Intolerance in Maine, addresses the roots of injustices, for example, how we've accepted ownership of Wabanaki spaces with very few questions over many generations. And the exhibit invites us to re-examine these privileges. Begin Again is a phrase from writer and activist James Baldwin's final novel published in 1979. And the title of a re recent book by Eddie Gloud Jr. who's going to be doing a talk next Thursday in the same online space. Um, his book was called Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Message for Our Own. Begin Again examines discrimination and inequities similar to those that Baldwin, Baldwin wrote about. And our title is a call to the people of Maine to scrutinize our present society by looking at the roots of 500 years of structural racism and intolerance and to find a place where we might create change. As we interpret the founding documents like the Declaration of Independence of 1776 and the Maine Constitution of 1820, we see that the system created to govern what we now call Maine and America was set up to benefit certain people and disadvantage others. But the roots of the colonization that our country is based upon go back to papal bulls that were created by Catholic popes one in 1452 that sanctioned the pillaging of Africa and the enslavement and murder of African people, and another in 1493 that authorized land theft in the Americas through murder and genocide of the non-Christian indigenous peoples. Collectively called the doctrines of Christian discovery and domination, they are the foundation of colonial settler supremacy that's woven into all aspects of American life, and they're a basis of our legal, economic, and social systems. By reframing the traditional main history that's been taught from one perspective, we've revealed other stories from the four co-curators and a network of 16 advisors, including thoughts about land ownership, scalp bounties, slavery, women's leadership, LGBTQ plus equality, child labor, the Klan, nativism, stereotypes, racism, and mob violence, all infused with stories of resistance, persistence, and survival. It's a lot to pack into one exhibition, and we're excited to share our thoughts with you tonight about how we brought it together. Um, to start out tonight, we're as I said, we're going to be asking questions of one another, and I'm going to begin with Darren. And Darren, I wanted to see if you could discuss how you helped us to frame up um, how the doctrine of Christian discovery and domination and the resulting colonization affected Wabanaki people and how we chose to show that in Begin Again. Thank, thank you, Tilly, and uh, welcome everyone. I'm uh, zooming in. Uh, from what is now called Dedham, Maine, in my own homeland of the Penobscot Nation, on a place I call Turkey Hill or Neheme Benage, which uh, Turkey Hill, there's turkeys that run across uh, below my window here, and they amuse me to no end. Um, I will say, uh, I also want, before I uh, start answering your question, Tilly, I, I, I do want to recognize also your work um, as, a, as, a, as a person at the Maine Historical Society where you and I think a core group of others, but I really, I'm gonna blame you uh, or credit you with really making Maine Historical Society a space for indigenous and Wabanaki stories in particular. And um, 
because it, it wasn't always so at Maine Historical Society. And that's okay. I don't work for, for you all. So yeah, I'll say whatever I want. But it is it is because of your work and other folks, it's been it's been just a pleasure working with you. And I really appreciate all the efforts you've made to make um, Maine Historical Society uh, a, a good space for us uh, as Wabanaki people. Um, so yeah, the question, you know, and I think what was great about um, trying to engage this work, I mean, we've all been in the sort of aftermath and run up to uh, Maine's bicentennial, you know, we've been struggling with how to how to really fully narrate, you know, Wabanaki uh, experience vis-a-vis -vis that. And of course, holding up the sky was the preeminent uh, exhibit to, to, talk, to talk about that in a very broad way. Um, but, you know, how do we have uh, these difficult discussions? You know, I think, you know, this is one of the challenges of any exhibit uh, like this. Uh, and you and I are both um, followers and lovers of the work of Fred Wilson. And, and you know, that, that, that's a really important uh, context where Fred Wilson is a, a curator, a, uh, an art installationist, a, 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 a deep thinker about the role of museums in um, modern American society and life. And um, I think what we were going for was, you know, we wanted uh, in the difficult stories and the difficult uh, discussions that need to take place to, to address what we needed to address, um, we wanted to have uh, an, an affective environment for people to learn um, and we wanted it also, we wanted also to include the Maine Historical Society as a space of, of, um, um, of both, you know, a troubling and, and possibly very good history, you know, I think telling all these stories at once of, you know, really putting the museum on, 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 on uh, or the Historical Society on its own kind of uh, track as as part of the exhibit, and and so I think, you know that what that does for the um, observer and hopefully the visitor of this exhibit is they get to um, not only learn things through you know looking at objects and reading the the uh, the, the titles and and whatnot, but also um, the way they move through the space and the objects that they are forced to confront in certain different kinds of sequences. And we spend a lot of time, and I don't know if you want to talk about this, about directionality of where people can begin in and in, in end or end and begin their experience of the exhibit. Um, so maybe I'll, um, I'll toss it back to you in terms of if you could talk a little bit about that and, and our intent on, on that. Yeah, so um, I'm, as, as you said, I am a huge fan of Fred Wilson, and he famously reinstalled the um, Maryland Historical Society in 1992. And he juxtaposed items in ways that were very evocative and also shocking. And I think that was something that we were really interested in doing as well, um, to try and get people to, to think on a different level. And, so um, one of the ways of deconstructing the way history is told is first of all, there's, there's not a linear timeline, right? So you're not going to start in one place and go in the other. And the other thing that um, you all as co-curators were really forceful in was wanting to create two tracks. And um, uh, one of advantage or privilege and one of you know, non-privilege and what did those look like? And so the exhibit is actually split down the middle with a red curtain. And um, that red helps to evoke um, thoughts about violence and blood, but also about the fact that we all share red blood, you know, no matter what color your skin is. So um, that, that was um, something that we spent a lot of time figuring out as a group, like how that was gonna happen and how we wanted it to happen. And, um, you know, unfortunately, technology doesn't exist the way we really <laughs> wanted it to happen, but we, we found a good workaround and I think it's, it's gonna be great. Um, but so people have to choose which track they're gonna take and then you loop around and then you reconsider what history you experienced and go through the other side. So, 
um, I mean, we'll see how people enjoy it, but I feel like it's going to be a really good learning experience. And yeah. um, the other thing that we're doing is, you know, this isn't a traditional historical society installation. Um, it's more of an art installation or a, a room installation. I think I said to you, Darren, that the exhibit is like an artifact in itself. Yeah. And um, so you'll you'll see things like sugar bowls are going to be throughout the entire exhibit, and they're this device to help you remember how um, main businesses were involved in slavery and in subjugation of of other people. So um, you know, I wanted to put them all in one spot, like to make a statement, and then I think it was Crystal is like, well, how about if we put them throughout the entire exhibit? And so you know, just this is a good example of how rich and um, better exhibits get when you bring more people in, more voices to the table, and um, being able to really go deep and um, access different people and their ways of learning by bringing more people to the table. So. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And <clears throat> now to, I, I, I just wanted to have that discussion um, because it's, um, I think by constructing this uh, through this narrative of choosing a track, um, you know, I think the idea was also that even if people think they know this history um, and are very well informed, or even if they're not, um, I think the, the kind of um, affective quality will, will make it a worthwhile visit for anyone. There, there you go, that's my uh, main historical uh, plug for you. Um, but I think to just to answer your question, you know, and I think um, you pointed out these papal bulls, of course, that that um, um, initially what is framed up, I think, as uh, religious superiority uh, moves from the, the, you know, the 15th century of these papal bulls uh, and, you know, have these origins uh, even before that in um, you know, in the Crusades and, and that and that kind of orientation, that this um, religious superiority, which is that you know Christians have a particular right to claim lands, enslave people, um, and and that moves into you know the the the, the forms of white su supremacy that that we see enacted through. Uh, uh, various forms of Americanisms um, as well, that, you know, those, those cognitive models, you know, are lingering, you know, and I think, um, obviously, it has very direct impacts um, on us as Wabanaki people that, you know, folks showed up and thought they could claim <laughs> uh, lands uh, through, you know, it's interesting, and I think most lay people think of it, it was sort of a uh, conquering, but it, it was actually a, a kind of legal fiction that was created that gave, um, a, and a collusion uh, across European nations that, that gave them this uh, superiority of being the only ones that could actually own or recognize or transfer land. And so I think, you know, from that, it, along with the, um, you know, the absolute dehumanization of indigenous and African people, you know, these twins um, operate in deep and hurtful and meaningful ways. I know people, many of the people are, are, you know, know the history of the Fitz Proclamation. And we, thanks to Jennifer Neptune, we have another sort of take on that and sort of how to, how to build off and, and, um, and, and maybe heal from, from those legacy. But, you know, these, I, I don't find that these, you know, and this, and I'll push this to back over to Crystal as well after this. I don't find these cognitive models, either the, you know, and I'm, I'm referencing Stephen Newcomb's work, um, his book called Pagan and the Promised Land, you know, where he talks about these ongoing idealized cognitive models of sort of the settler notion of why are they present in, in you know, North America, the New World, Turtle Island. Um, so there are these cognitive models that operate and still kind of uh, function through court cases and, you know, state of Maine uh, resistances to tribal sovereignty, that there is either this notion that um, land was taken uh, as, as a role of the conqueror, so might makes right, 
And then the other cognitive model. So people are like, well, you lost the war. So you, you didn't, you know, you no longer have your land, um, which is actually quite, that that's really not the case. Um, and then the chosen people promised land cognitive model, which of course, um, you know, as a Christian textual piece um, is about, you know, a certain group of people having a claim on a promised land from God. So that's where North America becomes this, this promised land as Christians arriving onto new shores. And of course, this gives way to manifest destiny and other kinds of um, orientations. But it, it, it needs to recognize and to build out the legacy of these various forms of supremacy, right? In terms for it to work, right? People, most settlers need to kind of orient themselves towards this either a conqueror model or somehow, and this is where you know notions of American exceptionalism, exceptionalism come from, that this was a promised special place for a promised special people. Um, and, and the way that manifests in Maine is, is really um, interesting. It's both unique in certain ways, but also, um, and for many of the horrible and, and evocative reasons, it also maps onto it very directly. Uh, so, you know, the, the forms of racialized su supremacies for indigenous people and Wabanaki people in the state is, you know, from Merch versus Tomer, we're imbeciles, therefore awards and have no control over our, ourselves and um, because we're lesser than. Um, and that structure gets built into um, the inverse of this chosen people promised land kind of cognitive model. So it's a, it's, it's, it, it strikes me, and this is just where I'll end this and I'll push it to Crystal is, um, we had this very interesting uh, discussion Tilly early, early on about um, this notion of a real Mainer. And, and I really, I really love that discussion. And I don't know if I've quite ever, I, I don't know if I figured it out. I mean, I know what the official narrative of, uh, of it is, is that you've been here for a certain number of generations and you have family that either worked the forest or the, or the waterfront. And, and we, we fancifully say people who have not been here for that long are not real Mainers. Um, of course, interestingly, I never got the sense that my indigenous <laughs> relations and ancestors were considered real Mainers. I never, I never picked up on you know, thousands of years of, of, of gener you know, hundreds of generations or thousands of years of presence as being, making me a real Mainer. Um, I think I probably had closer access to it um, through my French Canadian family <laughs> that came and worked in mills. Uh, and even they are pretty suspicious. And we go into some of that history as well. So I think it's, um, you know, how we orient and what are these ongoing legacies is something I'd love to hear Crystal talk about, you know, in terms of it manifesting both in policy, but in sort of the, the social, legal, and relationships that we uh, uh, have an ongoing, uh, uh, facing ongoing with Crystal. So take it over as I fumble. Yeah, no, absolutely. And there's so much that you just said that I like, that really resonated. And I'm, I'm just going to be snarky for just a moment. But I love how you were talking about, you know, the different cognitive models. And, you know, kind of one of them being like, oh, well, you lost the war. So you lost the land. And I just think it's kind of interesting and funny how that does, didn't really translate to the Civil War, right? And, <laughs> you know, so we still see signs of the Confederacy and celebrating the, the relics of that. And, and they lost. <laughs> um, and I, what I find so interesting is, um, you know, so much of what I experienced in working with all of you, which was a tremendous and valuable kind of journey for me because it was paralleling and feeding into my own personal journey, is that you start to see the cycles in history. And I think we're at another moment where the cycle is like, the cycle is closing or restarting again. And I think we really have a unique moment to make some and drive some really clear systemic change. And, you know, going back to uh, the doctrine of discovery, you know, at least from the, in the legal profession, what was so interesting to me is just how, you know, um, you have this doctrine and then it becomes embedded 
in the structure of how the, the society is governed and how it moves forth. And I love the fact that from a physical exhibit perspective, those are the first documents you see, the founding documents, you know, you, we see, you know, we've installed it so that you start with the doctrine of discovery, you start with some of the founding doc, um, doctrines of the company of the country. And um, in law school, one of cases that you read as a first year student is Johnson v. McIntosh. And it's a real property case. And, you know, um, I think there, it's commonly understood that real property is the way wealth has been preserved and passed down through generations. And this Supreme Court case was all about how the indigenous population didn't actually have the legal right to convey or sell their property because they were the conquered. And then the, the court was relying really heavily on the doctrine of discovery. And then, you know, interestingly, the, the, um, the jurist of the time, the, the chief justice and, and the court kind of um, became explicitly complicit in the system because they were like, oh, you know, this is really beyond the court's ability to influence or change because, hey, they're the conqueror, so what are we gonna do? And it just shows you how from really the foundation of the country, these systems and forces were working together to create this deep systemic divide that really continues to this day. And you know, for me as a black woman living in Maine, it was really interesting to go through this and to see other, um, how this doctrine and how the, the divide that exists um, has played out for Black Mainers over time, for Indigenous Mainers over time, and also for women and other disenfranchised groups. And, and I just have to give you like so much credit because you're just always there saying like, we need to make sure that we have the suffragist movement. We talk about women in Maine. We talk about those who were deemed um, mentally feeble. You know, we have to talk about wages. And I'd like, you know, Anne, to kick it over to you to hear some of your thoughts about, you know, pulling together the exhibit and thinking about those who were in the dominant culture, which were really um, wealthy white men and the women who supported them and then everybody else. <laughs> so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Crystal. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I I really feel like the junior partner in this whole group. I mean, you guys are just so amazing and have so much experience. And, uh, and I mean, Crystal talked about her journey, and I, I certainly am, am on a journey myself. Uh, and, uh, and it this has really helped me along. So I've, I've learned so much through this process. And, and I'm sort of I mean, I'm in this sort of schizophrenic position of being, uh, you know, here to talk about women's rights and women's rights history, but also being kind of the living embodiment of, of white privilege, right? I mean, my my forebears were probably actively involved in, in the murder and land theft of the Wabanaki people. I mean, I, I haven't traced them and that history exactly far back, but I, I'm kind of certain now that I, that I think that's true. And so it, it uh, was, it really, Kind of brought me to a standstill almost at one point where I was I was thinking well wait a minute I mean because the white white women really benefited from this system of of land theft that left and and um and genocide and slavery you know some white women did and um and yet on the other hand a lot of that uh you know the racism was accompanied by misogyny uh, that was also embedded in our in our you know laws and in our culture and in our religions and goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. So uh, women were definitely, you know, harmed by that as well. And, and so I, I really had to sort of keep those two things in, in mind and at the same time. And there's, there's one example of that. Um, and we I, we, I don't think we talk about her a lot in the exhibit, but um, there's a woman named Augusta Hunt, who was, uh, you may know her from her, her uh, descendant is Helen Hunt, the actress. And for 50 years, Augusta Hunt was, be, you know, she either supported or led every movement in Maine to improve the lives of women and children. You know, she supported equal guardianship, um, free daycare and, and nurseries and kindergartens, uh, Portland's first ever police matrons, uh, a woman's reformatory, you know, rest home for aging women. I mean, really by any measure, she was a tremendous force for good in, in Maine. And yet, 
here she is. She's married to a man named George S. Hunt, who um, owned the Forest City Sugar Refinery. And we discussed this in the exhibit. Um, the sugar refineries in Maine were directly tied to slavery in the West Indies because food and wood from Maine would be shipped down to the, to the West Indies. And then the molasses that was raised by slaves down there would be shipped back to Maine to be refined into sugar. And um, uh, you know, as we point out in the exhibit, uh, uh, you know, a, a slave who was who was brought to Cuba had a, an average lifespan of about seven years. So her her white privilege was really sort of founded on the the you know, or drenched in the blood of the slaves of the West Indies. So um, I mean, that's a that's a you know, we, we need to be able to keep those competing realities in our minds at the same time and, and figure out how to how to talk about them and, and acknowledge them. And um, we're still kind of working on that. But um, so I, it really has been, a, a, I mean, a tremendous experience for me. And, and I think the exhibit is very, very powerful. Uh, I'm going to sort of ask, you know, I'm going to ask a question of Tilly at this point and ask her to talk about why this exhibit and why now? Because I, I, I understand that the Maine Historical actually had a quite different exhibit in mind initially for this, this time slot. Yes, um, we originally had a historic clothing exhibit teed up for 2021. And, you know, first the pandemic hit and then um, George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis in May. And that really stopped us in our tracks and made us, you know, take a look at what, what we were doing and how we could um, discuss inequities in, in America and in Maine and try to add to the conversation. So, um, so we, the historic clothing will go in next year. So it'll be in um, 2022. And so we're, we're opening up Begin Again. And, you know, I have to really commend Maine Historical Society for taking this on, for pivoting so quickly and um, deciding to, um, to make that change in our programming. You know, the support of our um, management team and our staff and the the board of trustees, you know, everybody said, yes, this is the right thing to do. And I mean, we've, we've been scrambling and you all had to work really, really hard to, to make our deadlines, but we did it. And, um, you know, I think that the social justice bent isn't out of our wheelhouse. You know, we've done these exhibits like 400 years of new Mainers and holding up the sky. And um, so we, I think that we had made enough inroads with those other exhibits to be able to um, work with a lot of different people to pull this off really quickly and make it happen. So um, I'm I'm excited that we're adding to the conversation and that we're getting hopefully getting people to talk about difficult subjects and to think about where you know like a lot of people keep saying how did we get here you know they're completely dumbfounded how did we get here and it's like well you have to go back 500 years. <laughs> and take a look at, at what was happening then. And it, it just is a repeating story. And it's time for us to stop that repeat and to try and change for a more equitable future for, for everybody. Um, here, here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for asking that question. So um, I can't believe how fast our time has gone. Uh, before, I'd like to, before we take questions, I'd like all of us to talk about what we hope people are going to get out of this exhibit and maybe um, to talk about like one object that you think is particularly powerful or one way we installed something that you think is powerful, just to give folks an idea of what, what they'll see in the exhibit. Um, so let's see, let's start with Darren. Oh, so many. Um, uh, you know, I think, um, I mean, partly, yeah, partly because I'm just such a big fan of his, uh, you know, Corey Hinton has a short piece. And, and I, I just want to say, we have all these collaborators. I think that's the word we use. That's good or bad. That, and then people who helped us out, um, um, 
tell these stories um, and, and many amazing people. So if you look at who's participating, these are kind of like some of the most brilliant people in Maine that we could find to, to help us write and tell these stories. Um, but um, you know, Corey Hinton, who's a Passamaquoddy attorney who lives in, in, in Portland and um, talks about you know, uh, a member of his family who was murdered by um, white uh, hunters from Massachusetts in the 60s and, uh, and basically how they got away with murder. Uh, and, you know, just sort of that legacy of, of those stories that live on, you know, the, I guess the 60s, is that a long time ago? Not that long ago. Um, but, you know, just sort of the, you know, these ongoing stories and legacies and traumas that, you know, kind of just blip and are told in such impassioned, clear ways by people connected to the stories. I think, you know, as, as much as I give all my little lectures as an academic on this is what happened, blah, 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 blah. I find that, you know, the, the powerful pieces are these very personal, even on the privilege side, like these connections Anne talked a little bit about the, the Hunt uh, family uh, legacy. Um, you know, that that's a really, you know, feeling connected to it, I think is one of the first steps that uh, that an exhibit like this can do. And it's that um, that personal sense of connection that I think we weave in pretty well for something so, you know, we talk about the structural racisms and the structure of this, these narratives and the cognitive models. But I will, I, I, I just think that's a huge, uh, you know, thing that we did well. Hopefully people agree. Great. Crystal, do you want to um, talk about what you hope people get out of it and, and a, maybe an object that really speaks to you? Yes. <laughs> when will I learn? Um, I'm going to try to speak quickly because there's so much I want to say in response to that question. Um, I think what I want people to get out of this is first to, to honestly reflect on the history of our country, but more specifically Maine. Um, I cannot continue, like I will continue to shout this from the rooftop. We, these are cycles that we have lived in throughout the founding of this country. And um, a, a spiritual leader that I listened to says, uh, said seasons change with time, cycles change when we do. And this is a powerful inflection point in history that where we can change, we absolutely can change. And um, I think there are enough people who, who see the potential, who are willing to do the personal and community uh, work to ensure that we change. And I just, hope that people leave the exhibit experiencing both the, the weight of the moment, but also the hope of the moment. And um, with regard to uh, installations or, or pieces of the exhibit, ooh, there's so much, um, but I do wanna echo what Darren said about um, Corey. He is one of my favorite people. I love listening to him speak. He speaks so eloquently on so many different topics. So. Um, please come down to the exhibit to see what he's written. And if you ever have a chance to be on a webinar with him, take it. Um, another person is Arissa White. She is a black queer poet and professor at Colby. Amazing, amazing person. And she has also provided some really thought provoking um, a response to uh, some of our founding documents. And what I love about her work is she plays around with syntax and the sentence structure. And both Corey and Arissa, and um, yeah, Arissa were in um, some seminars that I did in the fall. So I got to really know them and their work uh, very well. And the piece that I want to highlight is actually the personal story of Charmaine Tripp. So she is, her family, um, she lives in Connecticut. Her family is descendant of the Malaga residents. Her family is the only, um, her family branch is the only line that are uh, visibly black um, of the remaining descendants. And it was so interesting talking to her and then reading her story because she has a very different um, and very heartfelt narrative. And it just raises questions about who gets to tell the story 
of the family and the experience. And um, it, it is just an incredibly powerful, touching piece. And I just invite people to come down to, to watch it or to read it. And Anne, I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, you know, I was recently watching a TED talk that was done by Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, where she warned of the danger of the single story. And I, I think this this kind of uh, you know theme has been woven throughout our talk tonight. And and she says that the single story creates stereotypes, and the problem with stereotypes is not that they are completely untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. And and um, so I'm I'm really hoping that that people are are willing to unlearn the single story that they may have learned in school. I mean, I grew up in New England, and and really, uh, you know, I was I remember learning in school that it was just those Southerners who were racist. You know, the, that the North really did had nothing to do with with slavery and racism. And and uh, you know, I kind of believed that for a lot longer than I, I should have. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say. And so, you know, I've really been that's part of my journey is unlearning the single story and and um, and learning all these other com complex uh, stories that are real. And uh, for me, uh, I mean, I think the the clan robe is is a is a really interesting you know, symbol of racism in Maine. I mean, a lot of people don't know that the largest Klan rally, I think, was in Maine. It was directed more at against uh, Catholics and, um, you know, kind of ironically, given the, you know, <laughs> the, the doctrine of Christian discovery, you know, and all that stuff. But yeah, there was after, they, were, they were really targeting uh, French Canadian and Irish Catholics there. But um, yeah, I, so I think it's, it's undeniable. I mean, that stuff is is very much part of our history that was only a hundred years ago, and we still see it, its legacy today. So I guess uh, it looks like Kathleen's going to marshal us uh, into some Q and A. Yes, thank you um, to all our our panelists. We're getting some questions from the audience. Uh, first question: Do you or do we anticipate future exhibits growing from or being inspired by this one? So I'm just going to jump in really quickly because I actually think that's a Tilly question. But Tilly, I don't think I heard you articulate what was your favorite piece or what. Oh what yeah, we really might struck you. So maybe you can roll those all of that into one response. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. Um, well, I I think that for me, I want people to um, I want white people of privilege to come to our exhibit and to. Um, experience it and um, listen more and speak less. I think that's that's my ultimate goal. Um, and as far as an object goes, um, Jennifer Neptune, we commissioned her to make a piece for the exhibit. So it will go in our permanent collection. And she thought really long and hard about what she wanted to make. And she made a blanket coat and it represents um, a family of Penobscot people who were murdered in, I think it was 1755. Um, uh, a man and his wife and their infant child were murdered for scalp bounties. And so this piece talks about that and it, it discusses um, the harm that it's done to, um, that it did to those people who were killed, but also to the community even today. And so, um, the fact that it's going in our permanent collection and the trust, I think that's really important to the trust that Jennifer put into us to to keep that piece and also into Corey for showing sharing his story. I mean, I think that's really important. Um, I think this is really ongoing work for Maine Historical Society. And we will have an online exhibit, so it will live in perpetuity online on Maine Memory. I also want to say that we can't tell all of the stories and we really invite all of um, everyone to tell their story on um, Main Memory Network. You can go on to My Main Stories and, and tell us your story uh, about inequity or, or just about growing up in Maine, you know, whatever you want, um, it just has to be about Maine. So I think it's ongoing work. I'm not sure how it will fold into the next thing we do, but most of the exhibits I curate have a social justice bent and um, I don't see myself stopping that. <laughs> so. 
Thanks, Tilly. Uh, another question, is the exhibition all visual or are there also audio, audio and tactile components? I'll take that one. Um, because of COVID, we've really had to scale back on our um, tactile components and our interactives. And so it's mainly looking at objects and um, reading the text. We do have a video about Malaga Island. Um, the way we have installed it, as Darren said, it's very empathetic and it's very, um, you're, you're sort of immersed. So I think that that kind of takes the place of some of that tactileness that we aren't able to do because of COVID. Does this exhibit lead visitors to any active engagement with uh, prejudice in Maine? I guess, so are, there, are there like calls to action here, things that you can, that visitors can really engage with? Crystal, do you wanna take that or Darren or? I'll jump in really quickly because I was typing this in the chat. Um, one of the things that we intentionally did and we talked a lot about was who gets to tell the history? Like who gets to tell the story? And for you know much of the history of this nation, the the story was told by the the dominant culture. And this is really an opportunity to begin to change that to essentially democratize history. And so uh, what the way the physical installation works is that when you reach one track, it will give you the option or the ability to loop around and experience the second track. And at that point of kind of turnaround or inflection, if you will, we actually have an opportunity for you to deliberately reflect and share your thoughts, becoming a part of Maine's history going forward. Um, so I would just, again, encourage folks to, if you, are able to go and it's safe for you to do so to, to um, experience the physical installation and take that opportunity to democratize history, as I like to say. Yeah, I think that's right. And and I think, you know, some of these, some of the questions related to that are, you know, sort of, um, and I'll just return to my, my previous point that um, we don't leave the history in the past. Um, um, we have living people connecting very personally to the ongoing legacies of, 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 of racism, discrimination, all sorts of different things. And I think, you know, that's part of the lesson I thought, I think we did a pretty good job with, you know, it's sort of like, oh, that happened a long time ago. I mean, I understand the attitude. Uh, that happened a long time ago, what does that have to do with me? And I think we really tried to build out narratives of like, this is, you know, your fellow Mainers are <laughs> wrestling with these things and really, uh, dramatic ways uh, often. And um, I also think towards the end of the exhibit, and this, this could be added to more, I think we're trying to connect to, you know, particular issues. I mean, I can't help but talk about, you know, some <laughs> some of our issues related to Wabanaki sovereignty that, you know, these, the, the, the struggle for our, our uh, recognition of our rights and sovereignty are directly related to the silencing of those things because of uh, white supremacy and racism, and that the the state of Maine just kept kept at it, uh, you know, created a very clear hierarchy that we were not fully people, and let alone had a had rights as um, uh, as sovereign Indian nations. So I think it's a very I think it's a very connected way of telling these stories. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, we also put a little bit of work on the observer, um, you know, like you will have to connect this <laughs> a little bit too. Um, and I think that work is really productive uh, in, in our world today. So I think we strike a good balance for both of those things. Like, I don't think we wanted to be super challenging in like, you know, blame Whitey or whatever. Um, but nor did we want to not have people do work, you know, and reflect. It, whether you're a person of color, you're a man, you're what, you know, I think the the, the work, the, to, the, the reflection to be done is really important. So I'll just say that. Yeah, and I'll just jump in there too. I think, you know, I you so often you hear people and, and Darren you talked about this initially is you know people have, have such pride in in their lineage in Maine you know their history in Maine and 
and um, and assert their rights as Mainers, the real Mainers, you know, over the people from away who are newer arrivals. And, and I, you know, I always joke that I've lived in my town in gray, you know, for over 30 years, but I'm still a person from away and I always will be um, because I didn't grow up in Maine. And, and um, but, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, again, going back to this notion of the single story, I mean, I, my grandfather was an attorney, his father was an attorney and his father was, an, was chief justice of the Maine Supreme Court. Um, part of the work I really want to do, you know, and it's easy to sort of sit there and say, oh, I come from this, you know, line of distinguished people or something. But I mean, the part of, one of my next projects is going to be really delving into that background. So I'm curious, what did they do in their capacity as attorneys, as, you know, members of the legal profession to um, extinguish the rights of Native peoples, to, um, you know, to to limit the rights of women? I mean, they were and here again, it's a little complicated. They were all suffrage supporters. Uh, you know, my uh, they were they were big on suffrage, um, so it wasn't all bad. But it's not all good. And and I think we can't cherry pick our our past and and just just remember the and tell the good stories. I mean, I, I, we really have to embrace all of it. I think uh, this question is probably. Um, for Tilly, but certainly anybody can chime in. Will MHS continue to deliberately co collect around themes like the ones addressed in this exhibit? Well, I think that our collecting in general um, is mostly passive. You know, generally people are giving us um, items because we don't have a lot of money to go out and buy things. <laughs> But um, we are really striving to contemporize and to diversify our collections because one of the points that we make in the section that Darren referenced about MHS is that you know, we can only tell the stories for which we have you know, things to support it. And if we aren't collecting from certain communities, we can't tell those stories in effective ways. And, We've been really creative in the in the past of you know how we can find those stories kind of slipped within you know these um, like the Pajepskit proprietor uh, collections. They're one of the oldest manuscript collections that we have, and it details basically the town of Brunswick um, and surrounding areas. And we were able to really look at the Ulster Scott um, story within that uh, you know English dominant narrative and also to talk about the native um, relations with the Ulster, Ulster Scots and to really look into things like the Means Massacre, which has been told from one, one narrative, you know, one single side of a story. And so what was going on at the same time and, um, you know, what was going on is that Wabanaki people were being hunted for scalp bounties and so they were retaliating. So um, I think that you know, the, the short answer is yes, we're absolutely always collecting um, from varied communities um, in order to tell cohesive stories in the future. And, you know, the best way we can, we can collect is you tell your story online, you know, tell your my main story. Were there any moments when you were all working together as a group learning more about this history and about how you wanted to do this exhibit, learning more about each other and the work that you all do. Um, were there any moments that were really tough, um, difficult, or maybe things that surprised you as you guys worked together and did your research? I'm just going to jump in and say, uh, no, I mean, for me, I, I think there were many opportunities for there to be, you know, friction points, but I, I just want to say I was really grateful for the generosity of, of uh, Darren and Crystal, especially, and, and sort of towing me along and, and my understanding and, and, uh, and uh, you know, being very frank and open about this history and how they felt about it, but, um, you know, not and not pulling any punches, but um, also inviting me to Come along with that understanding, and so I, for me, um, I would say no. I mean, it was it was uh, you know it's been a, a really I mean it's 
it's hard for me personally to think about all this stuff and and uh, the ways that I benefited from all this horrible history. But um, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't that wasn't like I wasn't beaten over the head with it. Yeah, and I would also say that you know there was a lot of generosity and positive intent as well that I experienced, and I will just you know take this as an opportunity to give Tilly another shout out because I think that you know not only is she like a consummate professional, but she's a very generous ally as well. And you know I think one moment that for me felt a little like tense and awkward, and I was like stomping my foot at least in my mind like a a kid was you know, around the Malaga Island story, um, because it has been a story that um, MHS has highlighted and highlighted beautifully before. And I really wanted it to be a part of this installation. It was really like probably annoyingly insistent <laughs> about it. <laughs> and, um, you know, Tilly was incredibly generous and, um, you know, making space and time to, to hear why and to look through you know, some other research that I had done. And ultimately, I think that where we ended up and having Charmaine's story as part of the exhibit is just like such a powerful place. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, we joked, Tilly assembled <laughs> a uh, uh, team of people that um, I think um, we carry with us that, that generosity of space and spirit to work uh, in a team so um I know she wanted to you know collect a bunch of difficult people to do an exhibit with but <laughs> I think it was really uh, uh a very conscious effort that um yeah. uh she knew us she knew our work uh and knew that we could collaborate you know like yeah you know, some people are best on their own honestly um but I think we all have a track record of working in teams and 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 sharing space uh, with people, and uh, yeah, I found it to be super rewarding. Honestly, I wish I had had more time. Like I feel like, you know, the process felt good, but it felt quick. And I wish we it, we could have, you know, if anything, made it kind of grittier and more engaged. You know, uh, you know, maybe that's maybe that's it. Part two, right, Tilly? We're gonna do. Right. Um, <laughs> We're gonna do a part two in, in five years or 10 years and then we'll really, really, who knows what will happen by then. So no, it's been a real joy. Well, and I will just say also that when you think about the power of having diverse inclusive teams, I, you know, not to toot our own horn, but to toot, like I think that we really like knocked it out of the park because it's not just enough to have people with different skin tones in a room. It's about allowing space for the ideas and the experiences to come together, bounce off of each other, meld into something greater where the whole is much, much better than the sum of its parts. And I really, I mean, when I think about what we've created with the installation and all of the, um, the writing that goes along with it, it is just so incredibly rich. I could not be more proud of, of how this turned out. Yeah, I, I think that we've created something that, you know, along with our advisors, you know, that can't really, um, can't be duplicated in, in a lot of ways, you know, it, it's, um, it's its own, like I said, it's its own artifact right now. Um, and I would welcome a re revisit of this in five years to see where we are, you know, can we, you know, we, we are asking people to think about, you know, how can you change our future? Because we're in a critical place um, as a country, you know, as a world. Um, we, one thing we didn't talk about is the environment. And we do talk a little bit about environmental destruction and um, what we can do to, to think about, you know, how we can how we can save this earth. And so there's a lot going on in the exhibit and um, I really hope people can come see it. Yeah, make it an afternoon event. Have a picnic after. It is definitely a lot there. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much um, for coming together and, and putting this exhibit together. We're all looking forward to seeing it. Uh, we have had a lot of thank yous uh, in the chat from the audience and folks expressing how grateful they are and how eager they are to see this exhibit. So again, thank you all so much for sharing your time, your talent, your expertise, uh, and thank you for coming together again tonight to talk to us 
uh, and to, to share, share your work and your thoughts. So please don't forget folks, the exhibit is scheduled to open May 27th and to be open through December 31st, uh, 2021. You can learn more information about, um, about the exhibit itself, the hours at MHS, how can you visit, how can you buy tickets, when are we open, uh, what are our um, pandemic uh, protocols that are in place. Keep on top of all that by visiting our website mainhistory.org. You can also learn more about the other upcoming programs tied to this exhibit, including our talk with Eddie Gloud Jr. on May 20th and with Edward Ball on May 26th. You can register for those programs and more again on our website mainhistory.org. And if you would like to participate yourself more in the conversation to share your story, your story about Maine, or to do some research from home about Maine, please visit that website, uh, that database that Tilly mentioned earlier, Maine Memory Network at mainmemory.net. Uh, again, to our panelists and to our audience, thank you everyone for being here. Um, and I'll give you all uh, one more opportunity if there's anything else that you would like to say uh, as we exit this evening, uh, please feel free. Be well, everyone, get outside. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming, everybody. Well, thank you all again, and I hope we'll see everyone back here soon and uh, stay well. <laughs>